and welcome in to One on One with yours truly, Jeff Dantzler. We have a legend with us today, oh, the great man. Malcolm Mitchell. Malcolm, I appreciate you so much taking time to, to stop by. We're going to talk a lot of football. We'll, we'll talk a lot of book club here with you, Malcolm. But the, the first thing we wanted to get to, and I've had so many people fire questions at me to fire at you, most notably our teachers, including my wife. So the, the first thing I ought to ask you is with the, the reading, your writing career, everything you've got on the horizon, has the passion for that come close to your passion for football, equaled it, or maybe even surpassed it? I've always told anyone I encounter that I always, I have always believed what I was doing off the field would be more impactful than what I did on the field. Now, is writing books the same energy as scoring touchdowns? They don't compare. But I think what I'm doing today, trying to inspire children, trying to be a resource for teachers, is 10 times more important than anything I've done on the football field. Well, uh, I would disagree with you. That touchdown <laughs> in Florida was extremely impactful to so many of us. But uh, along those lines, <laughs> and, and you're spot on there, Malcolm, yeah. have you gotten to meet anybody who knows you is just the author as opposed to and maybe even some kids out there or, or some folks who don't follow sports who didn't even re really realize that you were a football star too? It happens all the time. The most normal scenario will be there'll be a husband and wife that I run into at the grocery store and the husband mentions football and the wife mentions the book club and Five minutes into the conversation, the husband is no longer able to talk because now the wife <laughs> is talking about books, education, book club. And, you know, I, I kind of like that. I like having the opportunity to engage in both conversations because both topics mean a lot to me. Well, and you, you really are a renaissance man, Malcolm. And uh, when, when you, you got into this, uh, I'm, I'm sure that the passion for it was just incredible. Was it an intoxicating feeling for you? Just the more you got into it, you just wanted to dive deeper and deeper? The more I educated myself, the more I began to learn about myself and my surroundings and the opportunities that were presented that, you know, maybe don't appear at first sight. When I set out to write The Magician's Hat, which is what electrified this entire movement, um, even beyond the movement, a way of life, um, it started with the pure idea that if I'm an athlete for some reason people want to listen to me sure so I said to myself one day in a Barnes and Noble after I've just got re done reading maybe 10 or 12 Dr. Seuss books mm -hmm. I said fine if the world wants to listen to what I have to say maybe I should say something meaningful meaningful Malcolm um, going back to something you said and, and, and the meaning for off the field um, you are such a great player. Uh, injuries cut your career short. I mean, uh, unfortunately, in the game of football, it's an all too common tale. Yeah. Is, is there a part of you that said, you know what, and I know you're, you're a man of great faith, maybe th this was for a reason, and you were just such a happy guy. I know for a lot of players, when it's over, there's this tremendous sense of depression, but is there a part of you that felt like, okay, I, I had my great time in football, everything I did at Georgia, uh, winning a Super Bowl with, with the Patriots here, but now it, it's my time to affect people in another way. D did you feel like there, there was maybe you know, a higher power, so some karma, some timing with all of that? I definitely feel the only reason I'm not playing football anymore is because it was uh, uh, God's choosing. There has never been a moment on the football field where I felt like things were too hard where I felt like I couldn't continue. There wasn't a, a time that I felt like my athletic ability and my intelligence wouldn't allow me to execute and perform at a high level. Unfortunately, there are things that happen out of my control. And while yes, I believe it was God's doing, I still dealt with depression, anxiety, um, because that's been a way of life for my entire life. But luckily, along my path, God presented me with some things that end up taking over and being way more important than my performance on the field. And I feel like I'm lucky in that regard because there are a lot of players, a lot of former Georgia players that reach out to me to this day who need counseling, 
who are, are, are battling some demons because they no longer can do what they thought they were supposed to do for their entire life. It's just, it takes a lot of mental toughness. It takes more mental toughness to get over not playing than it takes to play. And, and Malcolm, how, how much of that is, is just with football? I'm sure you started playing when you were eight, nine, ten years old, like so many of us did. And so for, for, for practically your whole life, for all you can remember from Pee Wee to middle school yeah. to high school to college to football to, to the NFL, th that was what you did. And then all of a sudden, yeah. that's not there anymore. Well, I told – I was I, – I actually have a counselor that I meet with weekly now because of COVID-19. We do interviews like this or sessions like this, but I told her and the same thing I'll tell you. I don't have, my first memory of myself involves football. Sure. So when I reflect and think about the type of person I am, who I am, that is a part of that memory. And to strip that away and then to find who I am, well, that takes time to get through. So, Malcolm, do you have any advice? Because with, with, with everything that everyone is dealing with now, and I know for me in the springtime, I broadcast Georgia baseball yeah. games. And I haven't had a, a weekend off for, from doing baseball since – I, w I was a kid. I'm talking about even bat boying. So I, I, I go walking by the, the field the other day. I was going to see our friends, the, the, the Parkers, and it's a beautiful Saturday afternoon, and we're not playing. So along with everything and, and uh, this a situation we're dealing with, yeah, there's the big picture, but we also look at things through, through our own eyes. Right. And, and that calling those, it's so much a part of my identity I, I miss it so much, and I know so many people are missing doing right. the things they love and, and the things they do as a routine. Now, now obviously, these things are going to come back for us. In the meantime, what, what's your best advice on how to deal with that? I have two. I have um, maybe two tips. I would say expand your curiosity immediately. I started playing the electric guitar. I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I don't know how it works. You'll be well, great at that too, man. You'll be great at everything. You'll be the next Jimmy Page. <laughs> but it's expand your curiosity. I would say that's number one. Expand your curiosity. Anything you had on your bucket list that doesn't um, that doesn't require exploration, do it. For example, I know you wanted to write a book. Yeah. I know you wanted to write a script. Yeah. I want to help you with a script. <laughs> Here's the perfect time. The second point I would make is find uh, someone you can have intimate conversation conversations with, because that's extremely important. Like you're a friend, you're someone who I trust and I would open up to. Well, let's let's just have a conversation about our hopes, our dreams, so we can continue to build relationship um, and also fuel ourselves with what's needed to sustain throughout the day. I, that, that's wonderful advice, Malcolm, and and you are just such a such an inspiration to so many people i'll tell you something else um i think that, that always makes you feel we should always try and help people every day but i, I just yesterday uh, I, I gave a little bit of money to the food bank in northeast georgia that's one dollar uh will get meals delivered to I, I believe it's it's four times i mean basically you you give 10 bucks and it can change people's lives you know find a gofundme project an animal shelter i think right. anything like that when you, I guess the new term now for us old guys is, is pay it for, but when you go out and you feel like, especially now, and God, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back and say I'm some kind of hero or anything, but when you go out and, and you do something to help other people, especially when times are tough, I, I think that's one of the best things we can do right now. Well, I was having a conversation with Ann Sapp, who is the, uh, the director of programs for my foundation, uh, my foundation, Share the Magic Foundation, focuses on youth literacy um, and helping kids understand the lifelong benefits of it. Well, we're having a conversation this morning just about what's happening in, you know, everyone's efforts to make a difference and help, because that's what's most important. And we came to the conclusion that, you know, maybe we don't have the solution. But if we try and become a resource for children and teachers in this moment, we're doing our part. And if everyone plays, and do, here's a great analogy, if everyone does their job, <laughs> we will be okay. Amen. Um, 
I, I guess that's the approach that, you know, my foundation is taking. That's the same approach that I'm taking. It sounds like that's the same approach you're taking also. No, I, I think it's so important for so many people. And your uh, foundation does such a wonderful thing. Uh, you, you had your big fundraiser uh, earlier this year. Uh, if you could kind of talk about the, the, the goals of your foundation and, and how far you would like to take it, uh, what, what the broad outreach of it is, and anything that anybody can do to help you with this. So Share the Magic Foundation is the name of my foundation. It's a 501c3, and we started as soon as I graduated from University of Georgia. I graduated the University of Georgia in December 15. The foundation began January of 16. And we focused on uh, book ownership and making sure children know the lifelong benefits of being literate. And we've been doing that nonstop religiously for four, four and a half years now. Um, and an interesting part of our strategic plan was to implement virtual learning. I think two years ago, we realized, you know, in-school programs are great, but if you really want to have change amongst the masses and give them opportunities and plethora, you'd have to go virtually. Now, ironically, this situation happened that's making me seem like, or making us seem like we were ahead of the curve, but we started our virtual learning in 2017. So we have virtual re uh, learning challenges. Essentially, we turn reading into a sport amongst children in classrooms. Um, and right now, I think those virtual programs have become titans for not only us, but for teachers and, and students, because now they've become resources to use at home. And here's an example. We have Read Camp coming up. Uh, in the next month. ReCamp is a virtual learning program that's put in place to defeat the summer slide. Yeah. Children go on, register, they get their username and, and password, and then they immediately become a part of a pool of other students who are participating in the program, and they race to see who can read the most minutes during the summer. And based on, and the winners get prizes. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing to try to, we're trying to expand that a bit to get more kids involved, especially knowing they'll be out of school for the rest of the year. Uh, that, that's magnificent. Now, again, our, our, our friend John Parker, we were having the conversation yeah. and when it comes to, to, to learning and, and education, listen, math's important, science is important, but, but to start getting there, uh, reading, as we say, that, that's oxygen. You, you, you exactly. can't get anything else without that. And I, know, I, I think back for me, when I was a kid, I was reading every media guide, sports <laughs> illustration, brochures, baseball cards. I, I was writing the pro teams to get their game programs and all. And I thought, oh, my, my mom and dad, they don't seem to mind. And then you look back, they, they just want you to, to read exactly. that. My wife, Emily, who's exactly. teaching online right now with, uh, with 20 kids bouncing in on, on, on their laptops every morning. She's got the same philosophy. What, whatever you're interested in, just read and, and get that fire burning for it. Exactly. Well, reading is associated with um, financial stability, health, um, behavior. I mean, reading affects, I call it the trifecta, because if you can't read, it's safe to say you won't be financially stable, you won't be in good health, and you'll probably have an extremely high. Um, and I, I think when I, when I realized that, that's when the message became way more important than the passes I was able to catch. Because people in my community and communities around the world will be affected because of illiteracy. Malcolm, for, for you, if we can talk football for just a minute. Let's do it. Let's do it. Valdosta, Georgia Bulldogs, New England I Patriots. My, I, I wore my. <laughs> I mean, you talk about having some, some football heritage with the uh, with, with those three places, uh, and what I think was the play of the decade for Georgia football, when you split the two defenders down in Jacksonville, when you scored, did, did you almost feel like Superman? Like you, you could have jumped out of the stadium, but you had so much adrenaline going through your body at that point. Well, let me tell you, two plays before that, I got a um, what's what's the what's the name of the jumped in one of the players' face, and I got flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct. Mm -hmm. And we were driving to try to score. And we got put back 10, 10 yards because of that penalty. So I go to the sideline. Coach Rick chews me out. And I look up in the stadium, and my mom's giving me the look. Oh, God. So I'm like, ah. Man, I just hurt the team. 
Two plays later, Coach Rick puts me out on the field, and we call – I think I had a nine-yard nine, nine yard stop route. Aaron throws me the ball. I've been jaw jacking with the defender all game. It's against Florida. I catch the ball. He misses the tackle. And from that point on, it became a, a blur until I crossed the end zone. And when you say electrified, I felt like I felt like Superman. Anyone could have ran up to me, and I felt like I could have taken them on at that moment. Well, and it was moments like that that, that, that I was certainly anticipating uh, when uh, <laughs> I was getting ready to call a basketball game in January. My afternoon show co-host, mm -hmm. Chris Brame, texted me and said, Malcolm Mitchell was at Nick Saban's house riding. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, we're, we're going to lose him. But, but, but thank God you, uh, you wound up being a bulldog. And then Malcolm, uh, you know, obviously you, you had the injuries hit you. But I, I think back to the, the incredible year you had as a senior, too, in 2015. And then th that last game in the Gator Bowl to go out and style. Uh, you and Terry Godwin teamed right. up on a trick play. You, you, you were so versatile. So just, just, just so many wonderful memories. And obviously the, the game at Florida in 2012, is one that stands out, Malcolm. What are, what are a couple of your other favorite memories? I, I'm, your freshman year at Tennessee, three catches for yep. one twenty-six. That was a big one too. You know, I uh, I hate to um, bring ne negativity to it, but those moments mean so much to me now that I know, and I won't suit up and play football professionally or organize again. Um, and uh, my girlfriend, the, the woman I'm dating now, is expecting, and all I can think of, man, I wish, I wish my son could have seen me play, um, because those were some of the most memorable moments I think I'll ever have. Uh, just suiting up, uh, even going to, I was talking to Todd, Todd Gurley the other day, and we were just talking. You know, the best moments for us were actually getting on the bus as a team and traveling, having those moments to bond to learn more about each other, and to build a relationship. Once we got on the field, then it was just all business. But to answer your question, one of the most memorable moments for me might be 2012 Florida, um, 2011 Tennessee, and oh, here's a, here's a good one. I missed a year and a half because I went through an ACL, a fractured hip, and a meniscus. Well, I came back for a home game, and I was not supposed to play. Ron Corson called me and said, Malcolm, we think you're well enough to get a couple plays in. <laughs> I run in on a third down. I forgot who we're playing. I think it was Mississippi State, something like that. I run in on a third down. It was maybe third and eight. I run a, a six-yard out route. Don't get my death. Barely catch the ball. And it's fourth down, and we have to punt. And they crowd stood up and clapped for me. I'll never forget that moment because there, one, I did a terrible job. It didn't even get the first down. <laughs> but two, for them to recognize all the, the injuries that I had battled to get back to that position, I really appreciated that. Well, and part of it, what you're saying with the teammates is enjoying the journey is, is so important. Uh, with, with New England, uh, you, you stepped into uh, undoubtedly the premier franchise in pro sports of the 21st century. When you, you won the Super Bowl and got that championship, was it, was it both joy and also maybe even a sense of relief because it is such a long process in the pro season? I felt complete in that moment. I felt like everything I had worked for, all the injuries I had battled with, there were several, um, all the, the knick-knack, ankle sprains, hamstrings, broken fingers, fractured hip torn ligaments, everything, everything that I had battled to get to that point. I, I missed a lot of my family's birthdays. I missed, missed a lot of family gatherings. I missed holidays. I missed, you name it. That made everything worthwhile. And I, I cried tears of joy because I knew all the sacrifices I had made were worth it because I had got to that point in, in my career. Malcolm, it is the greatest misnomer in football. I always love it, especially for you growing up in Valdosta and then playing here at Georgia, the term fall camp in the month of August when it's about 120 degrees and full pads. By the time I got to, to New England, I mean, it was like 72 degrees, the wind's blowing. I'm like, you guys, and there are people are out there dehydrating. I said, you're not from Valdosta, I tell you that. <laughs> 
Malcolm, congratulations. I had no idea you guys were expecting. I'm so happy for you. I mean, I, I, what's, I mean, you, you've done all this stuff and now you're going to be a dad. Holy cow. Yeah, I guess that's the big, biggest challenge thus far. You, you'll be great. There's no doubt. Now, when's uh, movie, TV show, series, HBO? Wh what are you thinking? Because this is uh, your story, you know, between what you've done in, in football with a magician's hat, you've become this incredible source of inspiration here. Uh, really, the, the, the sky's the limit. So uh, kind of uh, give us a peek behind the curtain. What direction are you thinking now? So I have a new book come out. It's supposed to be late during the holiday season this year. It just depends on how everything pans sure. out. The title of that book is called My Favorite Book, My Very Favorite Book in the Whole Wide World. Um, that would be the second book that releases. I'm signed up to do a third. Uh, I know I, I was working with um, some of the, some writers to create the TV show. Um, book club that's kind of been put on hold because of the current situation also sure. we're supposed to shoot the pilot and present it to i think it was i forgot exactly which station it was we're supposed to present it to them in uh, last month but that got put on hold also um, I'm trying to think and i mean right now it's you know i'm, I'm a, i work full time for the foundation trying to get that to be the best it can be because I really think it has global potential and we can help millions, millions and millions of, of children. I can, will continue to write. I'll continue to work on creative projects like TV shows. I want to write a script for a movie and just go from there um, and then accept my role as a parent, which man, that sounds odd to say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Malcolm, we're, we're all so proud of you. You're, you're everybody's, uh, uh, one of everybody's favorite Bulldogs of all time there. I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are, and uh, God bless you all. Thank you for all you do, my friend. I appreciate you, as always. The man, Malcolm <laughs> Mitchell, going one-on-one -on -one with yours, <laughs> the old man here, Jeff Dantzler. Go dogs. Woof, woof. <laughs>